the, the way I really frame it to myself these days, which I think is like the, the most accurate framing is, is the ability to send a packet, which is basically computer A does some computation, uh, generates a payload, payload gets sent, computer B like, uh, you know, ingests the payload or like interprets it in some manner. So you have like compute, payload, compute. Uh, the goal is was really just to like build that core primitive that allows that An end experience for the consumer should be sign a single transaction, have the entire flow get executed, in, including the results. And ideally, uh, you know, can, you can eventually ab abstract away even some of those pieces. So you can imagine a, a wallet, a consumer wallet that you only have USDC in. And, you know, you look at whatever, 15 farms across eight different chains and you can just arbitrarily hop between them without needing to know the underlying chain, the underlying gas asset, any of the infrastructure. Well, super excited for today's podcast. Today, I have with me Brian, uh, co-founder and CEO of Layer Zero, and Eric Tornberg with me as well. Uh, so I think this is going to be a super interesting podcast. Um, I would love to maybe just start a off a little bit with who you are, Brian, uh, jumping into a little bit about your background and then how you got in involved in like the crypto scene. Yep, sure, absolutely. Um, okay, so I, I, as you know, background is like a little bit, uh, a little bit windy, a little bit, a little bit eclectic. Uh, I'll try to give kind of the condensed version. But um, grew up in a town of nine hundred people in rural New Hampshire. So just like set the scene as in like literally nothing to do in the middle of nowhere. Uh, you know, I had to drive an hour uh, to school on a bus each way. Like that, that was the environment that I was growing up in. I uh, got a computer when I was five years old, just like fell in love with it. Originally, uh, you know, I was just playing video games uh, obsessively, but eventually like found programming. Uh, but I was just glued to my computer uh, for, for most of my, uh, you know, early life. Uh, went to school for computer science, um, ended up dropping out after three years to play poker professionally, which was like a pretty controversial decision inside my family. Um, but did that... Uh, did eight years, 80 countries during that time. So just kind of took my laptop and went all over the world, uh, played the highest stakes you could possibly play, played every major tournament you could play, um, moved back to the States, Austin, Texas in 2010. And then uh, April 15th, 2011, uh, Black Friday happens and online poker gets banned in the US. So I'm like, well, I'm out of a job. Um, at that point, I hadn't written code in eight years. Uh, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, I ended up starting a company uh, with two of my closest friends from university who are actually the two co-founders of, of Layer Zero. So we'll, we'll kind of get there. Um, but started a company, um, ended up getting acquired two years later. So whole industry kind of rolled up and that acquisition happened. And again, didn't really know what I wanted to do in my life. Um, had just had my first kid. Uh, ended up taking him on uh, 12 months, 12 countries when he was one and a half. Realized three months in that I couldn't spend 12 months uh, without doing anything. Uh, so I just started like writing code for fun. I just see in DeepMind's Atari agent demo. And I was like, okay, like reinforcement learning. Like at the time it was, it was pure blue skies, like just really unbelievable. Um, and I was like, this, this seems really amazing. Um, so I started doing some predictive modeling uh, around around baseball, actually. I uh, hated the sport, but like had this really amazing data set. That I was like, okay, that's, you know, that's what I'll do. I'll mess around with that. I uh, showed it to a friend who said, Okay, uh, I know this group of PhD, PhD uh, MIT PhDs who uh, had basically done very similar research when they were at, at school. Uh, you know, you have to show it to them. I showed it to them and they said, this is like the coolest thing in baseball we've ever seen. We have to put you on the phone with somebody. I was like, sure, it sounds great. Uh, the person on that phone call was, was Billy Bean. So founder of Moneyball, GM of the Oakland days, uh, ended up with them. Uh, selling the baseball models and, you know, doing some more modeling work, but selling it to a bunch of the pro baseball teams. Um, after that, so I've been in crypto since 2013 ish. Uh, this was 2016 was rolling around, got very, very high conviction strictly on, on Bitcoin. I was Bitcoin maxi at the time, put a large chunk of my net worth into, into Bitcoin. I think we all have um, that maxi stage at some point in our, uh, or not. Hundred, hundred percent. I mean, that was like you know pre really a lot of stuff happening on Ethereum, um, but like I did that, and then of course like six months later, you know I was I was playing with everything, so it didn't last very long. But like that was that was the impetus. 
Um, and I got connected to uh, through a mutual friend, through uh, the first engineer out of Andreessen Horowitz. A couple of guys did a Google comma, and we we got together and built a company. Kind of early early stages of uh, end of 2016, early 2017, more like kind of like um, kind of like Coinless, like democratization of, of just like broad access with what this investment class would look like. That company pivoted twice and got acquired two years later. Um, Took a year to do independent research uh, with AI on you know AI research. Ended up showing it to Noam Brown, uh, and he was like, "Oh, this is like awesome! You have to you know you have to come publish this with us." And so uh, Ryan, Caleb, and I went and published that uh, with Noam Brown through Facebook AI research. Uh, subsequently, got cited by DeepMind, which I always mention as like a, a fun full circle for a college dropout from like inspiration to to them citing your work. Um, yep. So that was really cool. Um, and then around that time was just like things were actually happening on chain, like really interesting things. So then we started writing contracts for for external groups. We got asked by a hedge fund to write uh, to write contracts for like automatic trading between the first on chain dexes. Realized that was a really interesting space, and nobody knew what they were doing. Um, and our backgrounds, like we had spent a bunch of time in like pure optimization, and so then we started doing like ARB and Triangle ARB hyper competitively. It was just like you had to be the fastest. So we're like stripping apart Geth for custom node discovery, like doing all of these things just to try to propagate messages faster and just like um, have sort of like closer or, or more efficient access to the mempool. Um, and then eventually one day we just started seeing, uh, we started seeing transactions pop up where it's like perfectly placed transactions with zero gas paid. Like if they would have just paid gas to themselves, like I wouldn't have noticed for a very long time. They would have completely crushed me. But we're like, Oh, like the miners are literally colluding against us. Like this is not a game we can win at. And like yeah. eventually, you know, Flashbots comes in and commoditizes this entire process. But this was pre that. So this was like just miners strictly colluding. Uh, and we're like, okay, well, time to do something else. Um, and then, you know, through through just kind of like uh, playing playing around really and, uh, and and messing with some of the emerging stuff, we we, we settled on. Uh, on wanting to solve this problem largely for ourselves. And then, you know, that became layer zero. So uh, I said, I'd keep it short. That was not very short, but that is the windy way that we got here. Perfect. Perfect. No, I appreciate all the color. I, I always find it very fascinating. Just like, I think because crypto is such a deep rabbit hole, whether you're technical, um, whether you're kind of coming from the traditional TradFi world, and there's so many different angles to approach it and it all kind of like leads itself into crypto. And so, uh, super fascinating story. I, I I want to make this podcast a little bit more technical than you have in the past, uh, just given that I think uh, we can add a little bit more color here. And so I would love to kind of dive right into it. I think on a high level, you've mentioned in the past, uh, kind of like maybe a North Star for Layer Zero itself is connecting pretty much all contracts on all chains and kind of creating that Robin hood like experience where you're abstracting the underlying infrastructure. Uh, could you talk, I mean, on a high level, just to like that North star in the vision, and then we can dive into like some more of the technical details of how you do that. Yeah. The, the way I really frame it to myself these days, which I think is like the, the most accurate framing is, is early internet, had a bunch of intranets that sit around. You have Stanford, you have DARPA, you have whatever. You want to run computation somewhere. You have to literally take a disk, fly across the country, and like run it on their computing cluster there. Eventually, we build like the internet stack. We have, you know, all, all the technology that like enables that. And now you have like broad internet and you can connect everything. And sort of like the, the fundamental unit within that is like this packet, right? The ability to send a packet, which is basically computer A does some computation. Uh, generates a payload, payload gets sent, computer B like, uh, you know, ingests the payload or like interprets it in some manner. So you have like compute, payload, compute. Layer zero specifically is is arbitrary contract invocation with a bytes array. So it's literally invoke a contract here, some piece of compute, generate a bytes array or payload, interpret the payload on the other side. So, uh, you know, in, in the packet in the beginning seems like incredibly trivial and dumb in terms of like what you can do with it. But now it enables us talking and streaming and, you know, every, every literally everything that we do. And so uh, the goal is w was really just to like build that core primitive that allows that. And then you have all these things that come into it in terms of like, okay, great, you have this, but now you're going from like, I don't know, ETH to Solana and like, oh, great, like the prior when I was using bridges prior, the experience was like sign eight transactions on Solana, 
wait, uh, switch your wallet to Ethereum wallet, go get ETH somewhere. So like go to a centralized exchange, get ETH in your wallet, claim the transaction. And then like, maybe you get to see the result, right? And like, it was very clear that we needed the ability to like abstract the gas away from the end user. So like, if you're on Polygon and you're going to whatever, Avalanche, like you don't need to have both Matic and ABAX, right? You don't need to have both source and destination gas. Uh, end experience for the consumer should be sign a single transaction, have the entire flow get executed, in, including the results. And ideally, uh, you know, can, you can eventually abstract away even some of those pieces. You can imagine a, a wallet, a consumer wallet that you only have USDC in. And, you know, you look at whatever, 15 farms across eight different chains, and you can just arbitrarily hop between them without needing to know the underlying chain, the underlying gas asset, any of the infrastructure. Amazing. Yeah, I... I mean, a lot of it ultimately kind of boils down to the design experience that users have to kind of jump through. And as, as you were mentioning, I mean, today that process is, or previously, it was pretty cumbersome uh, by signing the multiple transactions, making sure you have gas on both sides, um, and being able, I think, as much as I love the crypto industry. We've done historically bad at kind of abstracting these compl complexities. And so uh, very excited about what you're doing and kind of handling some of these technical um, things and how so that they're not really uh, face to, or customer facing, um, so to speak. So on that note, uh, I think the team that you have built with layer zero kind of takes a much different approach to like traditional, like bridging of access or even like message passing. So could you maybe just to start off kind of talk about like other approaches in, to, in the past and how you kind of have taken a different approach today? Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. So when we started there, there were like a couple forms or basically uh, pretty, pretty central. So, Really, the two forms were, were middle chains and light clients. Those were like the prior. So light clients were kind of like IBC style system where you say, hey, some group is basically going to pass a block header to the other chain. They're going to pass every single block header. So very computationally expensive in terms of like rights to the chain. Um, and so you're going to pass every block header. And then once you have that, you can just arbitrarily submit a transaction and, and verify that, that it's... Um, you know, the, basically an, a valid transaction. You can do the Merkle inclusion proof. And so or whatever, whatever server so inclusion proof you're going to do. So this was fine uh, when you're talking between Cosmos chains, Tendermint, extremely cheap. When you wanted to go to Ethereum, you know, if you're going to write every transaction from Cosmos to Ethereum, you're going to spend like $50 million a day or something. And you're going to fill up every single block. It's just like completely infeasible to do. Um, so it was like the first approach. And that was, it's a pretty good approach in general. It's just not computationally efficient. Um, the second approach was basically a middle chain, which was like, you're going to write a transaction on source chain. This chain in the middle is going to arbitrarily uh, read and interpret like whether it's a valid or invalid transaction. And then it is going to write a transaction out to the destination chain. And the big problem with this and general problem in messaging is like the destination chain has no observability into the, into the true state of the source chain. So that middle chain really, if, if it is ever like, you know, small collection of nodes can be anywhere from five to 21 is basically a state of the industry. Um, if that is ever corrupted for, for any reason, it can arbitrarily write messages to every single application on every chain. So maximally, um, maximal damage inflicted everywhere. And it's not even like there's a certain type of message. It can just make up whatever it wants in terms of like payload data. Like, hey, give me everything in your bridge. Give me, you know, swap every pair in your decks and, uh, and you know, give me out the liquidity because don't worry, I, I definitely did it on the other side, right? Effectively um, creating a very large honeypot. Yes, yeah. You know, at some point, the largest honeypot the, the world has ever seen uh, in terms of that, you know, you're talking, you know, potentially hundreds of billions of dollars at, at scale. Um, our opinion in the beginning is we're making layer zero which actually has been like a pretty contentious point. We like, it is our opinion now that there is no system that you cannot get true trustlessness between messaging. So like that is a, that alone is a very controversial opinion. Um, and we've totally swung the pendulum. When we started building layer zero, the, the intention was that basically from the application perspective, you can get this ability of trustlessness by adding your own keys. But from the user perspective, basically you are, you always have like some, trust assumption that sits in this act. Same when, same when you use anything, right? There, there is no like true generic trustlessness. 
um, even though the term gets thrown, thrown around a lot. And so those were the prior state of the world. And I don't remember if you wanted me to dive into layers of approach, but like happy to do that as well. Please do. Yeah. Okay. So layers of approach. Really, when we built, like we wanted, when we were building this, we didn't want to build it. Like we were trying, like the inception of this was us trying to build a game between two chains. Like BSC came <laughs> yeah. out, got a lot of hype, and we're like, oh, like that's interesting. There's an execution environment that's fast and cheap and like sits on the EVM. And maybe we can do something interesting between like BSC and Ethereum. And we just started to build it. And then we were like, you, you literally need a centralized coordinator out here that just like triggers events. And like, that sucks. Like somebody has solved this and then nobody had solved it. And so like we started to build this. And the two things that like we really, really care about when we're building like the, the two guiding principles are basically we're, we're building a protocol, not a service. So we see a service as like, you subscribe to us, you basically delegate your trust to us and we provide the service. And if we get, I don't know, a government shutdown notice or anything happens to us, like, oh, service is done. Like, you know, we, can, we can't do it anymore. Sorry, guys. And, and then you're out of luck, right? We're building a protocol like Layer Zero. If the entire Layer Zero team disappears from the face of the earth today, dies, whatever, uh, Layer Zero will exist until the end of time or Ethereum makes breaking changes. Like that was very fundamental to us. So every single contract is entirely mutable, uh, totally open and permissionless from day one. Anybody, even if we stop doing everything we're doing, anybody can run oracles and relayers. Anybody basically like the network can bootstrap itself and exist. So like that was the first thing. And the second thing was basically if we wanted to be maximally malicious, our only goal in life was to be adversarial to applications and try to rug everything. Every application should have a way to protect themselves. Because at the time, bridging was being used in like very small niche use cases. But we knew very early on, like if you want the Uniswaps of the world, the Aves of the world, et cetera, to adopt this and expose their 10, 20, 30 billion dollars of TVL, there is no world they're delegating that trust to a third party system. And so they will need to have a lever of control of securing that. The goal from these systems is like there is some surface of risk right now, like you talk lending protocols, it's usually, you know, they have a multi-sig and the multi-sig defines risk parameters. And, you know, if they messed up those risk parameters very bad, like a lot of things could go wrong, right? The goal when moving over to a messaging architecture is that you extend that surface as little as humanly possible. Ideally, it's the exact same surface of risk now controlling the, the sort of like second mechanism as well. Um, and so layer zero has a single endpoint on each chain. Uh, any application can interact with that endpoint and the endpoints can interact with any application. So now we deploy an endpoint on Ethereum. Any incoming message can now trigger and wrap any DeFi protocol, even if it's not like built on layer zero, right? So you want to come in from Serum, you've done a swap there, you move money over and like you want to do a swap on um, on Uniswap V3, like no problem. You can make that entire pathway expose that even, you know, a wallet or other applic aggregator can like wrap that pathway. You want to have an NFT that you like move across chains, mutate the metadata, and then list on OpenSea. Fine, do it in one entire flow. Um, so layer zero is these endpoints that live on each chain. A applications only think about send and receive. So they send some, you know, create some arbitrary bytes array that's being sent and interpret those bytes however they want on the other side. Um, and then the message itself needs to get moved, right? And so transaction happens on source chain. That data gets broken up into two components, which is basically the block header or receipt route and the transaction proof. Uh, both get moved across chains by these two parties, oracles and relayers that the applications define themselves, uh, get submitted to the destination chain, um, and then you do the Merkle inclusion walk. So basically the proof walks to the roots, it shows that these two things are matched, and then assuming that's valid, message is passed on to the application on the destination chain. Very interesting. And I mean, maybe to wrap it back to what we were talking about earlier with how people, how you specifically in the layer zero team have taken this different approach is kind of exactly this like generalized message passing, which allows you to effectively minimize these honeypots that the previously um, solutions kind of in effect kind of um, exacerbated uh, to like really not not provoke but uh there is definitely a lot of money that was potentially at stake where the generalized messaging passage minimizes that as much as possible yeah i i think the real risk minimization in our framework comes from rather than having one central authority with x nodes that basically decides everything in the network you now have basically have risk charted so you might have I don't know, take some big prominent Oracle and say they were going to pass every message. Maybe it costs 
two billion dollars to break their security and you have five billion dollars of economic gain you can do like eventually one day maybe that will be broken in this model you have the ability to basically take that same construct but chart it across a bunch of relayers such that even if so in the other system like oracle gets broken everything is gone in this system oracle gets broken and is colluding with relayer a only this very narrow shard of exactly oracle and relayer a uh, are impacted. So everybody using Relayer B through Z, everybody relaying their own transactions, anybody using any other Oracle, completely unaffected. So you have like the same core component, but now you give applications the ability to say, hey, I'm pancake swap. I've moved cake uh, over to an OFT now. We're you know moving it across. There's X billion dollars worth of cake. We're going to run this relay ourselves. So even in, if you do that, if you run one of those components at the application level, so the Aave multi-sig, whoever, right? Anybody who controls the surface of risk of some application, you run one of these components. Even if 100% of other participants in the network are malicious, there's nothing anybody else can do. to You have 100% absolute guarantee. So you cannot unilaterally do anything. So there is not risk of like, You've lost your control. Something bad happened, and now you can rug everything. You can't unilaterally do anything, but you have veto rights on every single message that gets sent. Nothing goes through without your sort of signature or like participation within the network, which is a very unique architecture uh, versus existing systems, which really are just like, here's a set of nodes. Like, trust those nodes with everything, and just like, you know, they will be good actors, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I mean, maybe kind of going slightly deeper onto that, like one of the unique approaches that you also took outside of oracles and relayers was kind of pools versus like wrapped assets. Could you talk about that uh, as well? Because I think, I mean, you guys took many kind of novel approaches and I, I think this one is uh, unique and to be honest, uh, the optimal solution long term. Yep. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. So uh, this, when we launched Layer Zero, we realized that if we launched very early on as just messaging with no application built on top or no liquidity layer, you ran into this problem where, like, imagine a yield aggregator is a very simple example. Like, there's a farm on chain A and a farm on chain B, and I want to unstake ten thousand dollars and like go stake it over there. So you unstake here, but then you don't have inventory on chain B to like stake over there, right? So uh, you need something to like abstract away or, or move that value in a way that actually makes sense. And historically, you had done this through wrapped assets. You would lock up an asset on chain A, you mint a is sort of like synthetic IOU on chain B. And the problem is that the end user carries that risk in perpetuity. So if something happens to the contract on chain B, infinite mint or whatever, they basically now are worth zero. They take over the underlying. Now your IOU is worthless. If chain A gets hacked and... Um, you know, all the underlying assets are removed. Great, you have an IOU that's backed by zero, right? So, uh, and same with the messaging protocol is corrupted. Like, they, this is just a bad thing where the user carries a risk. A user is used to like, I absorb some risk when I use Uniswap, that the contracts work, uh, are functioning, you know, nothing bad is happening, etc. But as soon as I'm done it, I never think about it again, right? As a user, I go on with my day, I have my assets like, I'm in a, a static state and wrapped assets created this component where like you're never in a static state. Like at any point in time, that wrapped asset can become useless. And so we had this very strong thesis that wrapped assets were really terrible. And the existing method of using pools was really bad because uh, our general thesis was that 95% of bridging volume was going to come at the application level, not at the user level, because you have these big, you know, sushi swap existed on 16 chains. What they didn't want is a user to do a swap here, leave, go to some third party bridge, bridge across, and then like hopefully make it back to sushi swap again to execute the other leg. Like they want to own the whole leg. And then the wallets, like a layer above, they don't even want you to go to sushi swap. MetaMask makes $400 million on the swap function within MetaMask, right? Every person yeah. in the world is like, I don't want you to go to any DEX or yield <laughs> aggregator. Like we want to own it all here and abstract it away from you. And so you have this real like battle for eyeballs. And so um, one thing that is troublesome with having static pools. So the way they did it before is you'd have a thousand here and a thousand there and, um, you know, c connected to chains. And like, I say, okay, great. I want to take 500 over there. But by the time I got there, the pool had been drained from other chains. And so like, how do you handle that revert case? I, I won 500, but it's not there. So like, okay, um, do I wait until the pool fills back up? Do we revert and come back? And if so, like who pays the gas? Does the user pay the gas? Well, that sucks. Now they need the destination gas asset. Does the application pay the gas? Now I can drain the pool and spam it and like force them to revert everything. So there's all of these issues. So we 
created this concept of, of instant guaranteed finality, which is basically you need to guarantee on source to the application that this transaction will go through on the destination chain. So Sushi, when it executes a swap here and the bridge is happening behind it, it needs to know that it will get the results on the other side so it can execute the other leg. And that concept was like very, very novel at the time. Um, and so we created Stargate, which is standing pools of liquidity, 100% in native assets. Um, the user basically adds here, subtracts there. And there's all this interesting math in terms of like this uh, curve style sort of like pricing at the bounds and pools are being drained and there's like excess demand where uh, one person is charged like an, an excess fee and then that's being rewarded to the person who's like rebalancing the pool. But ultimately you have this concept of like native assets everywhere. So no wrapped asset risk. You get uh, instant guaranteed finality. So every application can easily compose this. And then um, the most important thing is this now shifts the risk from the users to the LPs. The LPs are being compensated for the risk. So the LPs get paid to stake there. They get they are yield, they get fees, they do all of these things. So like the LPs are used to pricing risk, that is their job. Uh, but the end user now, when they bridge across, they put in, you know, 100,000 USDC here, they get out 100,000 USDC there, exactly a native USDC on both sides, and they never think about it again, exactly like when they use Uniswap. So there is no risk carried by the user. And I think that was like a huge shift. It really is. <laughs> I mean, being able to get rid of wrapped assets, which as you were mentioning is virtually an IOU that could potentially be there and not be there. And moving fully to native assets on chain is a massive, massive leap forward. And so applaud you and your team for uh, figuring out the engineering to make that possible. One thing that I also think quite heavily about is latency and finality. And there, I mean, when I've spoken with, previous kind of people in the industry, how, I guess, from the technical approach, you said it's almost instantaneous. Is that kind of bottlenecked by the slowest chain of the two? Or like when you say instant, what do you mean? Yep. So instant guaranteed finality, not instant finality, right? So most of these chains prior proof of work had this probabilistic finality. And so ultimately latency is like a measure of security, right? And so uh, with Stargate specifically, we use like reasonably conservative risk parameters, but we allow every application, like at the end of the day, the application itself bears all of the risk. Like the risk is I'm mutating something on source chain. I'm doing and executing something with a belief state of the world of the source chain that is some way. And so like if I do something over here in the state that I believed was true was not, then there's no way for me to like pull that back on the destination chain. So a very simple example is like a bridge. Like if I'm, okay, great, I got 20 million over here. I'm giving out 20 million there. Like if this gets reorged and never got committed, like I can't get that 20 million back. So you want to be really certain or as certain as you can be that that 20 million is like very there on source chain. And so um, we allow every application to define this. Instant guarantee of finality is that as soon as it is committed on source chain, you have a guarantee that the end result will be there. So if you commit 20 million here, uh, and the system like tells you, okay, you are guaranteed to receive 20 million on the other side at the exact rate and for it to be there. There is no world other people can come in and drain. There is no world anybody from faster finality chains. You will always have the end result. And so you still have to wait for uh, like an appropriate measure of finality, uh, but you will never have a situation where you land and the um, amount is not there, basically. I see. So if, if, for example, like you were bridging $10,000 from Ethereum to Avalanche, uh, once it has been secured on the Ethereum side, you're guaranteed to receive that $10,000 on Avalanche. Yes. And gotcha. going outbound from Ethereum right now, you'll wait about three minutes and 15 seconds. Um, gotcha. So that is the latency. Going outbound for Avalanche, it's like eight seconds or something, six seconds, something very fast. Interesting. Very cool. Um, and maybe like, I think on that front, you kind of touched upon it initially with like IBC, but could you maybe recap some of the differences, especially now, I think because bridging is becoming a very hot topic. I think you're kind of early to the game in that regard, but now that it's kind of become front and center, could you compare like, again, um, like what IBC is doing with, um, with the Cosmos ecosystem and then also what Avalanche has been doing with kind of their native bridging as well. Yeah, yeah, 100%. So a uh, couple 
couple of things there. IBC basically, again, uses this, um, this concept of light clients, very effective within like extremely cheap, uh, fast finality chains. So like, because you can write so many transactions on Tendermint extremely cheaply, you can basically log every block header from every other chain, right? Uh, within the ecosystem. So fine. You want to write every block header from Ethereum to, to Cosmos. It's like a total joke. You want to write every block header from Cosmos to Ethereum. It's like basically impossible. Um, or like, you know, it would be exponentially expensive. So we think the light client system is extremely good, but again, it just doesn't scale economically uh, outside. There's a reason why basically you don't have IBC right now to Ethereum. You don't have IBC to all of these other chains um, because you just can't write, I don't know, uh, a million block headers a day to other chains or like whatever it is. Um, so that is like the primary, like great system. Um hard to scale in terms of like cost efficiently. Uh, in terms of Avalanche, Avalanche has two things. They have a native bridge, which is Ethereum to Avalanche. That is like this SGX cluster that basically uh, does that. So that's strictly like bring assets from Ethereum to Avalanche and, and then basically return them, right? Um, so, you know, this is effectively a wrapped asset bridge. They wrap assets on Ethereum, mint them over here, but they're just kind of like secure to Avalanche. Uh, or like buy Avalanche and then like return them back. Then they also just introduced, um, I need to think if I can remember the name. Uh, I think, Warp, I think is it yep. called? Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Which signatures. is basically this, this, this BSL signature that you can go. So prior, once you land in Avalanche, now they have all these subnets. So these like application specific uh, blockchains that, that are being spun up. And we're on almost all of those. So we do like, you can imagine a world where you have, you know, ETH as a, as a single uh, L1, and then you have like a thousand layer twos above it, right? Uh, you still need horizontal composability in that world because like, imagine even just Arbitrum, Nitro, and Nova. Like you don't want to like do a swap on one, like on Nova. I think, I don't know if I'm mixing them up, Nitro and Nova, but do a swap on one of them and then like need to wait seven days to go back to like then buy an NFT with like the money that you sold mm. for, right? Like mm. you yep. need the ability to have horizontal uh, scaling. You need the ability to have like asset composability. So we do that between all the subnets. Avalanche made a way to natively take BLS signatures um, and basically verify them on another subnet. So they're not doing any sort of like bridging directly, but they allow people like us to now use that primitive to do verification in a way that is like more efficient. Uh, it's super interesting. We we spent a bunch of time uh, with Pat Grady, who's like the primary architect behind it, on like uh, d diving into it. And, uh, it. It's really cool. My laptop's on 8%. So we're going to get a quick <laughs> tour of the office while we grab my charger. No worries. Okay. But um, yeah, go on. Um, no, I I've talked with Patrick quite a bit, and I'm always impressed with his depth of knowledge and some of the clever ways that they figure out how to kind of either scale or uh, with the bridging solution that they came up with. Um, one topic that I've also kind of seen pop up more recently is kind of the topic of MEV in like bridges. Uh, any thoughts on like MEV specifically? Huge amount of thoughts. Sorry, this of is a, yeah, this is actually <laughs> super, super interesting. Uh, and I think wildly, wildly under discussed topic right now. Um, let me plug in this laptop and then we can dive in. Um, no worries. But it's it, like an amazing, amazing topic to discuss. So basically, there's a couple framings of MEV around bridging. Well, one in, in pure bridging, there's not there's not really MEV because like what do you, what do you what are you gonna do right? You're just like putting in an asset, so like think of wrapped asset bridge, right? Like you put in an asset on side A and like you you get out an asset on side B. So wrapped asset bridge, there is no MEV, but in terms of cross chain messaging, there's a, a ton of MEV. And I think it comes out in a couple different ways. In pure MEV, if you um, okay, there we go. Um, in pure MEV, if you have a um, Basically, MEV is measured in milliseconds, typically, right? Extremely fast, extremely low latency, not in seconds or minutes. If you're doing a deck yeah. swap from chain A to chain B, uh, having like 10 minutes of heads up that the deck swap is coming in doesn't really buy you anything, right? Like it is ultimately like you create like MEV in most cases is like you disjoint the price on chain A inside some like slippage band. The person then executes at like the highest end of their slippage band and you're like arming it out on some other chain, right? This is like typically what people are doing um, is basically there's there's some value to be captured within like the parameter of the transfer. 
Um, and then you're like capturing that value. And it requires you to be perfectly positioned within the block. So like transactions happening here, you're going to be here, and then you're going to be either here or like arbing it out somewhere else. And so yeah. um, basically you need that perfect block positioning. So even if you had 10 minutes heads up that it's coming in, like you can't disjoint the price 10 minutes early because like then you've just created MEV for somebody else. And they're like, oh, great. They'll sell into you and they'll arb it out on some other chain. So like you still need perfect block positioning. So ultimately the surface of MEV remains exactly identical um, basically to, uh, to to getting in the mempool. So when you're coming into Ethereum, it doesn't matter if you have one minute, 10 minutes uh, or, or you know 10 milliseconds. It's like you're submitting the mempool and then MEV is like generated there. Now, where this is a little bit different is that the latency matters. So now if you are waiting 10 minutes, then you don't want to have this experience where like you go and you, you know, because of natural vol within the asset, you're now outside of your band of slippage and you revert because that experience sucks. We like come back and then what do you do? You wait 10 minutes again. So typically the slippage bands are like a little bit higher with latency because like, um, because you want to avoid reverts, which means there is a wider amount of MEV that can be extracted. But the way more interesting surface of MEV is effectively two things. Um, in most middle chain models, actually in all middle chain models right now, they have the ability to view the underlying contents of the messages. Um, so there's a massive surface of like the ability to censor. So um, I don't know, a governance message is coming through from something that's adversarial or, or could be adversarial. Like you have the ability to view that and then withhold it, toss it away, submit it and submit a transaction when. But more importantly, you have the ability to all incoming transactions through that chain to reorder transactions. So layer zero actually is something like we very, very, very strongly believed in. One thing that is fundamentally enforced at the technology level is non-sorter enforcement, which means one, no realer and oracle can see anything about the message before they pick it up. So they have to agree ahead of time to guarantee to deliver that message without being able to see any of the contents of it. And everything must be non-sorter enforced, which means it must be submitted to the destination chain in the exact same order it was submitted to source chain. So you have zero ability to censor, right? So in a world now where you have all of these uh, sort of like OFAC compliant nodes, and all of these other systems where like people are being forced through external parties to wh whether it be censor things or, or do things, there is no ability within the layer zero technology stack to do it. You cannot discard a single message. You must either entirely stop processing messages for so imagine you have a thousand swaps and you for some reason want to censor three of them you either submit none of them or you submit all of them there is no ability like once you hit that one that you're not going to submit everything breaks an application can basically choose a different oracle and relayer so at the technology layer there is no way to do that but the more important thing is when you're talking about mev is any system that doesn't have that, which is currently every other system in the world, they have the ability to reorder all transactions as they come in and extract the maximum MEV. <laughs> Ask yourself why to like, I don't know, the most mercenary high frequency trading fund in the world, like want to own the messaging layer. Like it is the ability to basically um, reorder every single transaction, extract the maximum from within. And so that is like the biggest surface of risk from all messaging systems right now is exactly that, is, is reordering and centering transactions. And from a technical point of view, how are you able to guarantee the ordering and that no matter what the message is, that it's passed yep. on? Yep. So it's strictly enforced within that point. Every every single message has a nonce, and the nonces must be submitted in the exact same order, right? So you can never you can never break nonce ordering. Interesting. Very interesting. Um, maybe. Uh, yeah, I, I think we could probably do like an entire podcast just on like MEV alone. But uh, it's, it's a fun, it's a really, really interesting topic. Definitely. But I, I guess like in the interest of time and uh, kind of chatting on a couple more topics, maybe moving on. I think one of, I mean, I would say a surprise to many of the kind of the past cycle since really bridges took like center stage has been the exploits and hacks that have happened. Can you kind of comment on, in your point of view, and I, I think you probably touched upon this earlier, but maybe rehashing it, is why these kind of bridge attacks um, were so prominent throughout the past couple of years? Yeah, so when I talked about what Layer Zero cares very deeply about in terms of like how we were building or like the fundamental principles of how we built, it is that every contract is immutable, Every validation library is immutable. We have the ability to publish new ones that people can opt into, uh, but everything prior is completely immutable. And so we are 
one of the, uh, definitely of all of the major messaging systems, the only one who does this. And so the problem has largely been this. The problem has been every messaging layer has the ability to basically change the code on the underlying applications above. So change all the security properties by up- updating their, and you know, most of them, they're like, they're trying to do this in a way that is um, well-intentioned. They're trying to improve things. They're trying to do things. But at the end of the day, like code is hard. Code can be buggy. And like, ultimately security should basically be measured by like how much TVL, like how big is a honeypot band and like how long has it existed for, right? Like that should be the measure. So like, as soon as you upgrade that code, like you're back to zero, you're back to effectively zero security. And so if you look at the Nomad hack, Nomad hack happened because the Nomad team pushed this code to the validation layer, um, basically changed the security properties for every application above. There was a bug, like everything rubbed, right? Wormhole got hacked for 325 million. Then they pushed a piece of code um, and basically forgot to initialize it, which put 1.8 billion at risk, would have been 100% TVL loss. White Hat found it, had to pay out a bug bounty. Three weeks later, they made the exact same error and literally pushed the exact same thing again, had to pay out a $10 million bug dollar bug bounty, would have been 100% systemic, systemic risk. Like, it doesn't matter how good the engineers are. It doesn't matter how um, well-intentioned they are. Nothing matters. If you have a surface of upgradability in your contracts, eventually somebody will make a mistake and basically everything will be at risk. Like that, I think, is by far the biggest issue within the industry is upgradable contracts, which is funny because it is seen as like absolute death within DeFi. Like it's not fun for Uniswap to have to migrate like billions of dollars to tens of billions of liquidity from like Uni V1 to Uni V2 and Uni V2 to Uni V3. But you do it because like, that is the way you like need to build within the industry to give users some some semblance of security and like be able to, to actually trust the code and use it at scale. But at the messaging layer, basically nobody is adopted at this. They're all continuously pushing code. And like so that by far is the biggest issue. Um, you know, there there are a bunch of like at the end of the day, most of it is just like flaw in code. Like in almost all cases, it has been that. Uh, I think upgradability is by far the biggest. And then there's just like other than that, you just have to have great standards. You have to have the ability for like review process. We spent the most money of any company in the entire world on audits last year. I believe we we're at like five million dollars we spent on audits, which is insane. Uh, we have the two largest bug bounties in the entire world, not even like within crypto, like fifteen million dollars independently for both Layer Zero and Stargate of separate bug bounties. Um, so, like, yeah, I mean, it, it, it is a amalgamation of a bunch of different things. Uh, but at the end of the day, like security matters and the way that you build matters. And I think people are still just doing it in a way that is super fast and loose when you're dealing with billions to tens of billions of dollars. Yeah. And I mean, even like, I mean, going back to like uh, some of the design choices that the Layer Zero team took initially to really minimize those honeypots as much as possible. Uh, uh, a lot definitely goes into it, but uh, I appreciate you adding color there. I think maybe so going back to like the initial kind of vision and like creating the Robin Hood like experience. Um, what would your kind of pitch be to like builders or engineers in the space to like build or use layer zero? And then I would love to uh, tap Eric in as well and uh, have uh, ask a couple questions. Uh, from someone that's rapidly learning about the space as well. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think the biggest, so the biggest pitch for us, which I think has been like kind of the unique, like the end goal for layer zero, like at the end of the day, we're a messaging layer, right? It is like the, the volume of messages is like our measure of success, right? How used as a protocol, how ubiquitous as a protocol. But it would be very easy for me to like trick people into trying to build something that does a lot of messaging, but ultimately is like, not really uh, that like that good for the product. And then like over time, um, you know, whatever, they're, they're like, it will be bad for them. They'll end up not using it, et cetera. So like the goal for us has always been, we work with every builder is like, what is the thing? Like, what is the dream state for you? What is the thing that you're building that will make like your protocol significantly better? That will make your end user uh, basically have like a more seamless experience. And I, I think this comes out in like a ton of different ways for NFTs has been hugely different than it has been for gaming projects. than it has been for, for like lending protocols, uh, which I think is super interesting. Um, so there's all these different surfaces. The biggest thing for us has been build those primitives that enable them to do this easily. And so that is, again, gas abstraction was like the number one thing. Like our user is going between a bunch of chains, like 
we don't want them to have to have both assets. And that's where you get buy-in from the chains themselves too, right? Like um, when, when you're saying like, okay, we're, we're going to build for applications on your chain, but they're going to like need to go to all these external parties and get all these different assets. Like now you can build something where like, say Polygon was the fastest and cheapest chain. You could build an application that lives on Polygon only interacts with all of the rest of DeFi, right? Third, we're on 30 chains right now, interacts with 30 different chains, every single DeFi application you have, and you never have any asset other than Matic and USDC, right? Like you don't ever touch or see anything else. When you talk about the wallets, when you talk to centralized exchanges with how they manage uh, deposits of like long tail assets across different chains, uh, when you talk to uh, whether it be the front end, whether it be TradFi, like there's all of these different verticals and I think each of them have like, uniquely different needs. Um, but I think like end goal is just how do you make their lives as, as easy as humanly possible? And I think most of the lens of what we build, like we are a developer tooling company, um, like at the end of the day, right? That is how we see ourselves. That is what we focus on building. And I think our end goal is just always build the things that, that make lives easier for developers. I love that. <laughs> I think crypto needs more of that. Um, being able to abstract complexities. It's, uh, not enough appreciated yet. Uh, I think Web2 has definitely mastered this, so uh, can definitely take some lessons from you and the team. Um, I guess, like, Eric, like, is there anything, like, I think, I mean, obviously we've kind of, like, dived, like, super technical in a couple aspects. I mean, there's the bridging components, there's different layer ones, there's different layer twos. What, I guess, for you, like, as, like, a crypto user has been, like, some of your biggest pain points? The, um, I uh, I don't have a great answer to, to, to that. I, I kind of want to ask a broader question, if, if okay. Um, I'm, uh, Brian, I'm, I'm curious if um, if you come back on the show t- two years from now, I'm curious how you think this this interview will be different in the sense of what are the things that you're still trying to, to figure out or the big questions you have or, or things that could play out in the broader um, ecosystem that would affect uh, Layer Zero and, and its development? Like, what, what do you think is still a uh, yeah. you know, big question mark? Yeah, yeah. I, I, so it's funny. The way that we build is, is kind of, I, so the question I always got asked the most by far is like, okay, are you like, are we going to have a bunch of layer twos? Uh, sorry, a bunch of individual like orthogonal layer ones or like stark design trade-offs between them. Or are we going to have only Ethereum with a million layer twos? And my answer, so there, there's, these were like existential questions that people were asking. My answer was always that like, I don't need to really care. I might, I might like have an opinion on it, but like at the end of the day, like I'm just building the base primitive that like is used in both of these cases. Like all the layer twos will need horizontal composability. Like all of that is needed. So like, I think the goal and how we built is, is really to be like relatively agnostic to how the space develops. I like, I've been in the space for a long time, like over 10 years now, I was minting gen zero crypto kitties, did not see the NFT boom coming. I was like farming yams at 300 million percent APY, like did not see DeFi summer coming, right? Like I don't necessarily have the inherent ability to like predict where the space will go with things in the way that like Vitalik probably didn't think the dominant use case for Ethereum over a bunch of periods would be like meme coins, right? And like dog money and, you know, whatever else. Like at the end of the day, like you build a thing that enables all this stuff to be built and then like people will surprise you in a bunch of different ways. So things that I think could be different, I think like, Data availability layer stuff right now is like super, super, super interesting and has like some really interesting implications. I think the zero knowledge stuff is super interesting and I have a hyper uh, sort of contrarian viewpoint on it uh, that that we are well known for saying we're right now ZK, in, at least in messaging. ZK, very interesting in, in roll-ups and like atomic settings and messaging, I think is is literally like does not provide what people say it provides right now. And I think there's like a very interesting debate there. I think you can still do some things with it, but like the state of like, this is pure trustlessness, like does not exist. Um, I think there are a couple different angles that are interesting. The, you know, the question is like, where does end adoption come from? But like my five-year goal is that literally we don't have this interview in five years and nobody thinks about us ever, but like we're, we're just ubiquitously used in like the underlying layer, right? Like what modern web developer these days like thinks about the OSI model or like the way Ethernet and TCP IP are written. They're just like not reading IEEE standards. Like it's just not happening. Um, and I think that is like the, the end goal is like to make enough abstraction that like 
the end developer and the people creating them don't need to think about is and chains or like different execution environments are seen as largely commoditized in the way that they are now, right? When you build on your web stack, your end user does not care whether you're using AWS Lambda or like you're using these things that are uh, hyper optimized for storage or computer, like whatever. It just doesn't matter to the end user. And it hardly even matters that much to your average web developer, maybe once you get to a level of complexity. Um, and so I think like that, that, that is really where we hope to go. So success is if we never talk again. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I mean, there's two, it'll be very polarizing success. It'll be at one bound or the other, but I still think that's the optimal outcome. So, um, I, I love that 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 answer. Um, zooming out a bit, you know, there we're, we're in this AI moment, right? Where there, there was a lot of energy on 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 Web three stuff, and 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 now where you know. It, it's time to build, et cetera. I'm curious what you say to people who, who got in when it, when it was hot um, and are now, you know, sort of maybe second guessing, oh, maybe they should have, you know, they're deeply technical. Maybe they should have spent more time in, in AI stuff. Like, what do you, what do you say to, to those people in, in this moment? So again, having gone through 2013 and 2014, 2017 and 2018, and then now, like this has just been a repeated cycle. And uh, even even me, I guess I became one of those people in AI where I like where I got in with like, again, total blue skies, super interesting. Like it felt like anything could be done. And then when I left, it was like all we're building is like mediocre heuristics and like what the heck are we doing here? And then now, you know, now it's just like, OK, LLMs have made things like very, very interesting again. And so um, I think ultimately the only way you have real success with what you're building is like and I tell this a lot to people who are building is like you need to have just unfathomable amounts of conviction and like the thing that you're doing, right? Like it is by like, by the time you get to any measure of reasonable success, like you will have had eight different opportunities to give up and quit like along the way. And so like, if you don't have extremely high degrees of conviction, you're going to find one of those excuses to quit ahead of time. And like, you need to just be completely certain uh, outside of everything else that you like, one, can build this thing, and two, like, want it to exist in the world. And so, like, I think anybody who doesn't have that measure of conviction, anybody who's just, like, sort of, and it's fine to be, like, this generalist who kind of chases what's interesting. And, like, there's lots of people who just, like, spend a lot of their time um, trying to learn, like, learn a little bit about a lot of different things, be up to date on relevant topics, and, like, oh, this is actually more interesting. So you have these, like, bands of, of where you're spending your time. And I actually think that's totally fine. But I think, like, if your goal is to build a world-class company or like build a piece of technology that really gets used at scale ubiquitously, like you have to have the most obscene amount of conviction that like um, you, you probably like, it should be a litmus test like before you actually begin the company, not like in the middle where you're like, Oh, actually, I guess I didn't care that much about this thing. Like there's something else that's more interesting now. Like it's a conversation you should have with yourself ahead of time. And I think anybody who's doing that, like, is severely, severely dampening their, their chances of like actually building something at scale that, that's really great. Um, yeah, uh, maybe on that front, I mean, I think famously you've said when you were uh, raising money for Layer Zero, you never had a pitch deck. Uh, you just had a product. Uh, and, and I think, I mean, now obviously, because crypto has gone through these various cycles, uh, of up and down, sometimes fundraising is easier, sometimes <laughs> at the moment it's much harder. Can you talk, I mean, personally, just about your fundraising process, uh, like being able to actually show a product and advice to like founders and builders today that are in a more challenging fundraising environment? Yeah, so I, I will definitely say that our experience was like very atypical. So I'm not sure that it's like hyper repeatable, but like, Again, the inceptions of the company were like me and my two closest friends in the world just building something we wanted to build for us. The goal was just like build the thing so we could use it. Was it we like we never set out to like make a company, right? Um, and so at first we had this this thesis of like what this bridge might look like uh, that that was like a better bridging. This was effectively Stargate, but in a, but in a purely pairwise manner. Um, and so that was like the, the earliest iteration was like, okay, that was the thing that we were going to build. And then we realized like, hey, we're still reinventing this transport layer that sits beneath it. Like that is clearly the generalizable problem and like what should we should be spending our time on. Um, and so then at that point, once we started to do this, we had 
some really good friends of ours who basically were like, please let us give you money. And we were like, okay, we took, we you know, we took this small amount of money early on. And we're like, okay, we, you know, we're going to launch something. Um, and so we took that. And then, um, after that, we just, we kept building, uh, basically put out, um, our white paper. We put out a couple other things. And then we got interest, like our first conversation with somebody else being like, let us, you know, let us take this entire round. It was somebody, somebody externally basically preempting us. And we said, okay, but like, you know, maybe, but we, we don't really want one person to have the entire round. So then we said, what, what do we actually want to accomplish from this round? And so at this point, we, you know, they came in or they had like said they wanted in and a couple other people had got wind of it and they said they wanted in. So now we're, you know, oversubscribed. And we said, what is the thing that we actually want to accomplish here? And it was like a very DeFi focus. So if you look at um, our, our cap table for that round it was co-led by Binance and Multicoin. And then it was Sino, Defiance, Delphi Digital, Robot Ventures. It was basically take like the largest stakeholders slash people who are doing interesting things in like every major DeFi protocol in the world. And like those were the people we want to be talking to because that was what we were building at the time. Um, then again, we just kept building. We, we thought that round of like 6.4 at 50 would be the last round we ever raised. We're like, okay, like we don't need anything more. We're just going to go through and like launch the product. Um, and then we put out a demo, uh, which was my original like 10 minute demo, just showing Stargate and like what is possible on top of layer zero. Um, and shortly after that, um, you know, we had, we were preempted. We had, we got eight term sheets in eight days. And so we're preempted by, by this massive, uh, you know, sort of like group of people. We had term sheets ranging from 300 million to a billion five. We ended up turning down a billion five to go the billion. Um, at the time, again, it was like that we had, you know, $1.6 billion in commitments for like $135 million round, right? So wildly oversubscribed. Um, and our, our goal at the time was again, what, what do we want to actually accomplish here? Like, what are we getting out of this? We didn't care about the money at all. It was purely like, what are we doing? So as a technologist, we're like, we're very comfortable with what we're building and how we're building. We know the problem we're working on. Like, we don't need help in that. That's not what we're bringing in. What we needed or we didn't know uh, is basically how to build a world-class company. So like, we turned down the billion five to go with, you know, to get this tri lead of like Andreessen Horowitz, Sequoia, and FTX, who at the time we thought were building a world class company. We're like, oh, we can learn a lot from these guys. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that really was like the lens of that round is like, how do we leverage like this group of people to, to build a world class org? Like people have been through it, have been adjacent to all of these orgs. And so, like, that was really the goal of that round. And again, was just this, this series of preamps and it was a mixture of like, Okay, so go, going through all of this, the biggest thing I will say is like, one, have to have undying conviction. Like that comes off from founders, founders who are like, I don't know, wishy-washy, like, oh, maybe we'll build this thing, but like maybe this thing would be more needed so we could pivot there. Like the bet that he's like, I am as atypical in background as it gets for like a Sequoia backed company, right? Like, 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 it's just, it just isn't there. So I like, what did, what did I do that, that convinced like this partnership and Andres and all these other groups to like make a bet on us. And one thing is, is again, that, that conviction, there was no like, Oh, maybe we'll do this. Maybe we'll do that. I was like, this is the thing that we're building. This is how we're building it. And like, even if we don't raise around or never raise around, like we're going to build this thing because this is a problem that we're solving. Right. So like we had that high degrees of conviction. The other thing is Ryan and I, my co-founder, like the way that we work and the way that most of layer zero was like, created was us sitting in a room for like 10 hours a day, just like yelling at each other. Like our wives thought we hated each other. And we're like, no, no, like, this is just how we like, how we discuss things. And so like, like we are as adversarial minded as possible when, when like comparing ideas and how to actually design a system, but the goal is always ground truth. And I feel like having done that for so long, the questions we got asked in diligence across the board from every, from the most technical groups to anybody were literally basically trivial at that point. Like we had already considered those things a hundred times before in every angle of that surface. And so like it seemed when people were talking to us that we had thought of every trade-off, every technical, like to, you know, we, we had really like gone through. And so like, think like having a grasp, like a real grasp on, on what you're building, not need to be like, Oh, well, we'll figure it out. Right. Like, like we had very clear answers on here's why we made this decision or are going to design it this way. Here's the set of trade offs. And I think like those two things can get you incredibly far in the fundraising process because just having those two things alone 
really separates you, I think, from like the average group of founders by by such a high delta. Um, that I would say like that that is that is the biggest thing. Um, also, by the way, as an aside, am I chopping a ton? Like it's super choppy on my side. I don't know if there's something I can do to kind of like address that, or if the recording on our end will be fine. So you guys tell me if it's coming through fine for you. It it should. I mean, it's a little choppy, but it should be fine on the recording. Um, so. Okay, oh, good. Cool. But no, I uh, I mean to to your point there. I mean, I fully fully agree. I mean, I think I 100% echo the statements of like ground truths. I I feel like people do not spend enough homework to actually try to establish those ground truths and I mean, I feel like I was kind of manic in a similar way on like scaling and blockchains for a year and trying to really articulate the ground truths of uh, figuring out how blockchain scale. And then that conviction, I mean, whether it's a founder or a fund, uh, being able to unwaverly kind of hold that point of view, unless kind of new information comes to light that like directly refutes those points uh, is very rare. And so I definitely appreciate uh, the strong opinions that you hold and the homework and all the research that you and Layer Zero team have put forth to uh, build your product and uh, kind of make uh, steps towards really getting to that Robinhood like experience of abstracting a lot of the underlying layers and unifying kind of the entire ecosystem. So, no, thank you again, Brian. I, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Uh, thanks for joining Eric and I, and uh, appreciate what you're building. Yeah, hundred percent. Thank you for having me, and uh, nice to nice to dig in on on some of the technical stuff. I always like I like having conversations that like feel different than the other. I know people have heard me talk a bunch about whether it be my background or like what Layers are is doing. And the last thing I want to do is just like keep presenting the same information to people. So I, I like the different surfaces of, of conversation, and I uh, I think the more technical the conversations are, the better. So. I fully agree. I, I like talking with engineers. They're the one building things. <laughs>